Welcome, everybody. Please, uh, please keep everyone on mute so we don't get any background noise uh, initially for the presentations. Um, welcome to the Fibrolamellar Cancer Foundation Fall Series of virtual events. Uh, my name is Sandra Vassos, and I'm the uh, Foundation's Patient Community Director. So before we begin the program, I just want to review the agenda a little bit. And since we have a large group, um, just a couple of the, of the ground rules uh, for this evening. Um, the program uh, is going to be presented in two segments. The first segment consists of opening presentations and a moderated panel discussion, and it will be recorded and archived for our website. The second segment, which will begin roughly at 740, I know we started a little bit late, um, that segment will not be recorded. In that segment, our support group moderator will continue the panel and open it up to the broader group for discussion. To ask a question, simply unmute your phone or your video. I'm gonna try to call on as many people as I can in order of the unmuting. We're gonna try to end at 8.30, but I know that these things sometimes go over, so we'll see how we go since we've started a little bit late. Now to kick us off, um, I'm going to pass it to our president, John Hopper. Hey, thanks, Sandy, and welcome, everybody. Um, as many of you know, I'm John Hopper, the president of the foundation, and thanks so much for joining us for our very first virtual caregiver gathering. Uh, as many of you know, uh, we usually have an annual event in Vermont in end of August or beginning of September which allows patients and caregivers to get together and really talk about and share whatever you want, uh, which is so wonderful to have. And I'm hoping that next year, as you can see from the picture from, I think that was last year, uh, hopefully we can all get together next year. So stay tuned for that invitation. Uh, I see some great familiar faces there, which always puts a smile on my face. Uh, Tom Stockwell, our dear friend and a big advocate for fibrolamellar, uh, David Carls, I see Kathy Green and many others. So thanks so much for joining. And I see many new faces. So welcome to the community. Uh, for those of you who are new, just a few words on the foundation. Uh, this is our 11th year, as you all may know, this was started by Tucker Davis in 2009. And Tucker's mom and co-chair Marna has joined us as I think most of you people know, people know Marna. Um, we have a threefold mission. Uh, the most important part is research. By far, we are looking for curative therapies, and that's where probably 90% of our efforts go. Uh, education and awareness. So many people don't even know about this cancer. So we scream as loud as we can. We tug and we push and we get into the best places we can to research for us. And we ask you to do the same thing. The more they can talk up fibrolamellar, the more awareness it brings, um, and the more that people know about our cancer. And the third and very important part is the patient community, which this, this is all part of, to bring the patient community together to share information and to create a strong community. Uh, we've spent over $8 million uh, since we were founded in research across more than 20 different institutions, and they're really the best in the world. Uh, look at, go on our website, please, and just take a look at the list of those who we have funded. We also work closely with pharma. Uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, we're working closely with right now. Genentech, hopefully soon. The National Cancer Institute, the Food and Drug Administration, the Department of Defense, and as many of you hear me say, it's the second largest funder of cancer research in America. And they've spent over $2 million in the last four years on fibrolamellar research. So we're very involved with those. We recently won the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Rare is One Network Award. And what that basically means is we're part of a community that goes into what Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, and his wife, Priscilla Chan, have in terms of their interest in rare diseases, saying they're hoping by the end of this century, every rare disease has some form of curative therapy. And they're putting the money behind it. And they look at foundations like us and say, we're one of the ones they believe can make it happen. Importantly, what they're saying is that the patient community is a critical part of it. So caregivers, patients, your involvement in helping to forge ahead with the research in any aspect that we can do it, whether it's donating, you know, biospecimens, whether it's participating in a survey, whether it's propping people up in front of the FDA, it's the patients that are gonna actually make it success. So more to come on that. 
Uh, we've updated our communication platform, so please go visit our website, fibrofoundation.org. Kurt Losart has been a fantastic leader for us on that. We have a resource center there now, and there's an opportunity there for all of you to share data with each other. So again, go to that. In fact, soon we'll have on our website, if you haven't gotten one of these yet, it's our annual report, it's our anniversary report, I should say. So look for this in your mail, and if you haven't gotten one by the end of the week, email us and we'll send one to you. But it's a fantastic summary of what's going on with the foundation. And last but not least, a uh, couple of weeks ago, we received the highest rating from Charity Navigator, which is the place people go to see is a foundation worth me giving money to? Are they actually managed correctly? Are they using the money correctly? We got a hundred out of a hundred. So we're really happy about that. So basically they say give with confidence. So a lot more is going on, but that's kind of a top line for those of you who, who don't know us that well. Important notes for tonight. Uh, one is while time is limited, the conversation doesn't have to end tonight. If Sandy says 8.30 and we're gone, you can email us. You know, go to info at fibrofoundation.org and just post questions to us. Or again, go to the website and see what's in there for resource centers. There's places there that you can actually add comments and questions along the way. Number two, um, Fibro and Metal Cancer Foundation, we cannot give medical advice. We're just not allowed to do that. So as you post questions tonight, please understand if questions come up about medical advice, we can provide what we think are some of the best resources out there that we know. That's what we're doing on the website and with our talent to say, here's things you should know and go and figure it out amongst others, but we can't give medical advice. Um, so a quick call out to a few of our caregivers who volunteered tonight to answer some questions. Again, Marta Davis, the mother of Tucker and our board chair, uh, Melissa Finley, a longtime advocate in front of the foundation for many years. Kurt Losart, again, a longtime advocate of the foundation. And again, our, our brainstorming guy for our brain power in terms of the whole database and digital effort. Again, we're really, really so happy about that along the way. And then I think somewhere in the audience, we've got Dr. Mark Firth, who is our head of our scientific director. Um, again, many of you at some point should get to know Mark also. So let me introduce our discussion moderator and speaker, and it's Lauren Chatalian. So Lauren, first of all, thank you to your organization, Cancer Care, for letting you speak tonight. We appreciate you. Uh, Lauren is an oncology social worker at Cancer Care and Cancer Care's Women and Children's Program Manager. She provides in-person, online, and virtual supportive services to individuals and families impacting by a cancer diagnosis. Laura maintains a clinical concentration in women's cancers and childhood cancers, keeping current of changing trends and new knowledge that affect the programs and delivery of clinical interventions. She's a member of the National Association of Social Workers and the Association of Pediatric Oncology Social Workers. She holds a master's of social work degree from Boston University. Lauren oversees numerous support groups and community events throughout the year and is a frequent speaker in cancer care education workshops. And with that, Lauren, you're on. Wow, quite the introduction. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, and thank you for having me here tonight. I'm so honored to be with all of you. I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Um, as John mentioned, my name is Lauren. I'm an oncology social worker at Cancer Care and also a program manager I'm working in women's cancers, but also childhood cancers. Um, just a little tidbit about Cancer Care in case you've, you've never heard of us. Um, we're a nonprofit organization. We provide free professional support services and information to help people manage the emotional, practical, and financial challenges of cancer. So some of these comprehensive services would include case management, counseling and support groups, educational workshops, publications, and limited financial assistance. 
we have national online support groups um, and some, several of the groups actually offer um, a caregiver um, perspective or a caregiver outlet. So one of those is actually caring for a child with cancer. I wanted to um, make sure to mention that it's a smaller group that's, you know, kind of getting going. Um, so maybe that would be of interest to, to you know, some of us tonight. Um, I can definitely provide some more information um, a little later in the program, but I wanted to um, to mention that I'll be speaking a little bit about caring for your loved one and you know caring for yourself, and then we'll tr transition into more of an open discussion. While much of the information I share may be familiar to you, I want to be sure to touch upon important aspects of caring for your loved one and yourself. To start, let's take a step back and talk about what it means to be a caregiver. The National Cancer Institute defines a caregiver as someone who gives care to people who need help taking care of themselves. Caregivers may be parents, spouses, siblings, friends, such as yourselves, and being a caregiver entails a wide array of responsibilities, from practical to physical to emotional. Caring for a loved one diagnosed with cancer can be extremely challenging. There are many worries and concerns that you both may be experiencing. It can also be difficult to determine how to best support your loved one as well as support yourself. One thing I hope everyone recognizes tonight is that you're not alone. You're here in this community. Going through a cancer diagnosis is often described as an emotional roller coaster with many ups and downs. As a caregiver, you may see your loved one go through a wider range of emotions. While this can be difficult for both of you, your willingness to listen and offer support will make a difference. Loved ones may not specifically state what they are feeling or what they want or need. Patients may feel that they are burdening caregivers more. While we know this is not true, continue to have a space for open communication. A patient and caregiver are two very different roles. Sometimes it's hard to understand what the other person may be thinking or feeling, making decisions together, talking through decisions, and offering one another's perspective can help as you move forward. It's important to build that foundation to be able to support, trust, and face these challenges together. A cancer diagnosis raises many practical concerns and challenges. There are appointments to track and bills to pay, as well as paperwork to manage. As a caregiver, it likely falls on you to manage many of these tasks, in addition to keeping up with your usual responsibilities and possibly filling in for some of the roles that used to be handled by your loved one. Understanding your loved one's insurance policy, possible benefits, employment rights, financial options, to name a few, um, would can be important during this time. There are also professionals at the treatment center who may be able to help navigate some of these concerns. Um, these professionals would be a financial counselor, social worker, patient navigator. There are also websites and phone applications that could be useful. Um, this includes My Cancer Circle, Caring Bridge, MyLifeline.org. Consider seeking support and information from others. Caregivers who receive help report feeling less isolated, anxious, and even depressed. And having a community of support, such as this one, can help to maintain physical and emotional well-being, which in turn makes someone better able to care for a loved one. I understand that caring for your loved one is your top priority, but I do want to acknowledge what you are experiencing as a caregiver and making sure that you care for yourself as well. This is hard. You have been dealt an extremely challenging hand. It's okay to be tired. It's okay to have fluctuating emotions. Your days are full. There may be time limitations. You don't want to spend time away from your loved one. And honestly, you may feel that there's not enough time in the day to spend even two minutes on yourself. Caregiving is a 24-7 full-time job. If you don't take a break, you could feel burnt out. I'm going to bring up the term self-care, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Self-care is defined as the practice of taking an active role in protecting one's own well-being, particularly during periods of stress. Sometimes I tend to forget that self-care can actually be whatever it means for you. What if some relax relaxation techniques could be done as a family, 
taking a deep breath together for a quick reset, or spending five minutes reading once your loved one falls asleep, or try to even get some rest yourself. Sitting next to one another, doing a word puzzle book during treatment, or finding a game that you both enjoy. This could be your self-care. Self-care does not need to be away from your loved one. It can be something that can be done together. As difficult as it is to hear and even think about, how do, how do you have the capacity within you to care for someone else before caring for yourself? I do want to note that everyone's experience is unique and what works for each person or family may be a little bit different, but I do hope this information will be a helpful reminder as you move forward. So at this time, I'm going to shift into, into introducing our panel. Um, we have Marna, Kurt, and Melissa, who will be um, part of our panel this evening. So um, each of them will share briefly about their caregiving experience, and then we'll open up for questions as well. So to start, um, we'll be hearing from Marna. And Marna, I'd like to welcome you to share a little bit about your caregiving experience, and also if you have any practical tips that have been um, particularly useful for you as well. So I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Lauren. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Marna. I'm Tucker's mother, Tucker, who started the Fibromyalgia Cancer Foundation in 2009. He was diagnosed at 26. He, he passed away at 28. I'd say we had a, we had a village helping us. We, we were fortunate that way. Um, my husband and I and, and Tucker's girlfriend and Tucker's brother and our neighbors. So, you know, if you can, if, if you have a village, it certainly helps. Um, people, our, our neighbors brought, you know, started a dinner chain and brought dinner every night. So I didn't have to think about that. One thing I did was I, I stopped doing everything I was doing. You know, I, and actually I, my life got very simple. And that was, that was kind of actually nice. You know, I stopped my bridge lessons. I stopped my tennis. I stopped I had stopped all these things that I was doing and I just concentrated on Tucker. And um, we kind of divided and conquered. Chuck dealt a lot with um, the doctors. Alicia, Tucker's girlfriend, um, did a lot of the internet searching. I did a lot of the note taking and organizing of notes and things like that. So we, we divided up the responsibilities. And I think I think too, you find the things that you're good at. There's a lot of stuff that needs to get done. You just, you find the things that you're good at and, and you kind of, hopefully you have others that you can give off the things that they're good at and that maybe you're not good at. So you, if you can divide up the responsibilities, it's helpful. But then the, the one thing I think we did with Tucker in the 18 months he, of his journey with Fibo Lameller was we lived. As much as we could, we lived, you know, we, um, we tried to make as much out of that time as we could, you know, we, we were hoping he was going for a long time. You never know. Some, some do, some do go for a long time. And that was always good. We always had hope and, and um, we did a lot of things. We enabled him to do a lot of things with his friends. And I remember one of his friends from college came to visit him, this great gal. And she came and she was a little scared about coming into our house. You know, she was afraid of what she might find. She just thought it was going to be all gloom and doom. And we were, you know, we, we, were, we were having cocktails that night. He wasn't having cocktails, but he had his Shirley Temple at 27 years old, you know. But, but we had a fire going. We had the, I don't know, the Rangers game on. And, you know, it was, we were living we were living and I, I think Chuck and I look back on his time and in some ways it was a good time you know in some ways we gave Tucker the best 18 months we possibly could give him as parents you know even though there were a lot of challenges but we were all there you know his brother came home from college and and we were all there and so as caregivers, I think we can look back and say, you know, we did the best that we could do. We all can do it differently. You know, we all, like you said, Lauren, every, everybody's situation is unique and different. And, and um, hopefully your journeys 
will go a lot longer than ours did. And, and as I said, many do. So, you know, hopefully that's where you're going. But I, I think that's, for now, I, I think that's, those are my tips. Okay? Yeah. Thank you so much, Marna. I think um, all really important, really important things that you shared. I really appreciate that. And um, I'm sure that there'll be some some questions for you also once we, we open up to questions. Um, now we'll be hearing from Kurt. Um, Kurt, I'll turn it over to you if you'd like to also share a little bit about your experience and then any any specific tips that, that you have in mind also. Thank you. My name is Kurt Losert. My wife, Elizabeth Rippey, was diagnosed with fibrolamella in 2004 when she was 41 years old. She passed away in 2017 when she was 53. Altogether, we had a 13 plus year struggle with fibrolamella, running the range of an initial series of liver resections leading to an inoperable situation. She had a liver transplant. After a liver transplant, she had almost two and a half years with no evidence of disease. Then a long period of time with kind of a onesie, twosie, different sorts of metastases would appear, be surgically attacked and removed. Every six, eight months or so, she had another round of surgery and then reached a point where some of the additional metastases were inoperable. So we went into the treatment, systemic treatments, um, radiation, you know, et cetera. Uh, I think she underwent uh, seven different chemotherapy regimens, a number of different rounds of radiation, a number of clinical trials, and, and eventually uh, passed away in home hospice. So my caregiving journey ran in the realm of trying to research the fiber la what um, initial discussion of what is this rare disease what does it mean she was diagnosed in 2004 which was before fiber lamella cancer foundation was even founded finding information about the disease was extremely difficult finding doctors familiar with the disease was extremely difficult but clearly we did the best that we can uh, or best that we could my advice, and I tend to view the caregiving journey that I underwent having you know, three main areas of focus. One, on the patient, my wife. Two, on the family. My two sons were in second grade and fourth grade when she was originally diagnosed. So dealing with them growing up for 13 years with or the mother who's got a serious illness. And then third, critically important, is focusing in on what do we do from a medical treatment perspective. Starting on that particular dimension, my philosophy is knowledge is power. It's a rare disease. There's no standard of care beyond surgery. Do your research, become your own advocate, push the medical team, be willing to change your medical team as you find more information and as your needs as a patient evolve. We dealt with many wonderful medical providers during the course of the journey. And as my wife's needs changed during that journey, the type of oncologist that we needed to work with changed as well. And so we made some adjustments along the way. In terms of focusing in on the patient, one of the things that my wife and I found really helpful is continually plan your roles. You know, my wife was the type of person who, because she was dealing with this illness, did not want to be the one to talk about it to friends, to family, even in a lot of respects to the medical community. So as we thought through what roles each of us played in the journey. I became the communicator externally. My primary role was to help map out what potential treatments and, and care changes you know, we may want to make along the line. And you know, we continued to have conversations 
about you know, the relative roles as we went through. Those roles changed uh, because she wanted to be a normal mother, wife, friend. She, she wanted to do as much as she could and certain little things like, uh, like cooking. Initially, that was something that she wanted to really, really drive in the relationship and for the family. But as she entered the realm of rounds of chemo, and sometimes the thought of food was enough to turn her stomach, we shifted roles like that continually. And on the third dimension, family. One thing in one series of interactions that my wife and I had that I found extremely helpful was at Mass General, there's a clinical psychiatrist named Paula Rausch. And she founded a program that Mass General has been running for close to 20 years now called Parenting at a Challenging Time. And one of the things that she really focused on as someone has children dealing with a parent of serious illness, just try to keep to a routine as much as possible. That routine can be simple, that routine could be complicated, but in order to help especially young children deal with some of these things, the more stability, the more continuity, the more simplicity in their life, I think is extremely important and something that we tried to do over the uh, 13 years that you know we dealt with this as my sons went from grammar school to college. Thank you so much, Kurt. It was really, really great to hear from you and, you know, a lot of great points, um, you know, advocating and, um, you know, especially you know, going through this experience with children and, and how do you manage that and navigate that? Um, definitely something I'm sure we'll, we'll continue to speak about. Thank you. And uh, now we'll be hearing from Melissa. Um, Melissa, if you could briefly share about your caregiving experience and if there are any, you know, practical tips, um, you know, any advice, anything on your mind that you think would be useful for others. Thank you, Lauren. I'm Melissa, and I'm Liza Blue's mother. Um, they call me Mama Blue in the foundation. Um, Liza was diagnosed in 2011, and her story is so similar to Tucker's. Uh, back then, there was nothing. The foundation had just gotten started. Uh, they, you know, we didn't have everything in place like we do today. And I just started researching. Um, when she was diagnosed, she was diagnosed at stage four. They gave her a year to live with no options of surgery at all. And uh, I had a village like Marna, and we lived life. I don't know, something, I knew that Liza wasn't going to make it. From the very first time they told me she had a tumor in her liver. And I think that that was kind of a preparing me for what was coming. We had 18 months. And we lived our lives. We, we went on trips. We danced on Bourbon Street. We went to New Orleans. We flew angel flights twice a month. Um, it was an amazing journey. The first thing that I did was I got somebody to take care of me because I was the caregiver taking care of her. My um, oldest daughter, Lacey, middle daughter, she I gave her my debit card, and she said, I'll take care of you, Mom. So anything that I needed, if it was someone's birthday, if I just needed something for me, she was right there for me because in a way I knew that the day was going to come that Liza wasn't going to be with me anymore and I needed to, I spent all my time with her as her caregiver. Uh, we raised lots of money to fly, we to fly back and forth to MD Anderson and we finally got in a clinical trial. And for those of you out there, please find the social worker at your hospital and um, make an appointment with them because there's all kinds of resources out there. You have to search for them. Because once you get into a clinical trial, you, you qualify for angel flight. And we flew twice a month to uh, Houston. 
and they have volunteers that will pick you up from the air from that little airport, take you to the grocery store, get you anything that you need. And also the American Cancer Society, there's lots of resources there. You have to search for them. You know, back in my day, we had to search for answers for fibrillinella because there just wasn't that much knowledge out there. And the hospital then was MD Anderson. Dr. Kasab was the doctor. I know there's so many now. But that was, you know, that's where we went. And we never gave up hope. Not Liza never said, I'm going to die. We, we hoped all the way to the very last day. We never called hospice. We just lived our lives until she was gone. And it was, it was beautiful, like Marna said. We had an amazing journey. I miss her every day. Um, I know that the doctor, we have a lot of cancer in our family. And she asked the doctor about that. He said, Liza, Barbara Lamella is a pure case of bad luck. It's a pure case. She was 23. She died when she was 25. And I remember she was complaining of all the stuff that everybody does. The weird stomach issues. And I would send her to the doctor and they would say, she has irritable bowel syndrome. And I finally got tired of hearing it and took her to the doctor myself. And said, we're going to find out what's wrong with you. And the doctor in the emergency room said, I studied it in medical school, but I've never seen it. It's fibrillomella. And she wrote it on a little piece of paper for me. And I still keep up with all of you guys. The If you haven't been to Vermont, Vermont is my healing place. Uh, my heart is out there for all you moms. I know how hard it is. Take a little bit of time for you. It's so easier said than done. You can't do that. You're, all your time is spent on your child. Find, try to find somebody that can take care of you. That one person that can take care of you. But I'm really to, happy to be here tonight. Thanks for asking me, Sandra. And I think that's about all I got. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, really powerful and, you know, really awesome to hear from you and, and appreciate your story and sharing it with everyone. Um, I would like to open up, you know, just for some questions for um, for the panel, for Marna, Kurt, and Melissa, if, if you three are open to it. Um, if anyone has some questions, you know, from, you know, what they each shared, um, you know, anything specific you'd like to ask, you know, please, please feel free to do so. 